Hello friends, welcome to lecture 6.4 on the topic of Wigner-Willi distributions. In the previous three lectures, we have looked at the definitions of Wigner-Willi, studied the theoretical properties and looked at illustrations of Wigner-Willi on a few standard signals, where we also learned that there are a few drawbacks with Wigner-Willi that we would like to address. But before we do that, it is useful to know how the wigner relay itself is implemented in practice and that is the subject of this lecture where we are going to talk about discrete wigner relay distribution. In particular, we will look at implementation of wigner relay for sample data of course and that is what we call as discrete wigner relay. In fact, this terminology is analogous to the discrete Fourier transform where we compute the Fourier transform on finite length data over a finite grid of frequencies. And the issues are more or less the same, but there is an additional complexity associated with Wigner-Willi. <coughs> also, we, whatever we are going to discuss, although it is being discussed in the context of Wigner-Willi, it is equally applicable to the smooth versions and the modified Wigner-Willi that we shall learn subsequently. Therefore, uh, it is it is good to know how these issues uh, are addressed in the wigner relay because the theory also is fairly easier to understand. Once we go to the smooth ones, then it is difficult to follow what is happening. There is a lot more math there. Okay. So, let us look at the prime question of interest in this lecture. The continuous time wigner relay is given by this definition. This is again something that we have seen in lecture 6.1. And the two questions that we want to ask is how do we sample this wigner willi in time and in frequency? Because the theoretical definition is defined over a continuous domain of time and frequency plane. Essentially, we want to know what should be the sampling interval for both tau and z, that is the time and frequency axis. And is there any issue, uh, are there any challenges in evaluating the wigner willi for finite sample data? At this moment, of course, the natural question that arises is why is this a special question to ask or why does this deserve special attention? Can't we use the same ideas that we have used in short time Fourier transform where we sampled the time in the same way as we sample time for the signal itself. So, the spacing in time for the short time Fourier transform is exactly the same as for the discrete time signal there was nothing to be really worried about. The only concern was spacing in frequency, but then because short time Fourier transform involves a Fourier transform of the segmented signal, we could simply borrow ideas from DFT and therefore, there were no specific issues to be addressed. Why does wigner willi distribution or why does the sampling of wigner willi distribution call for a special attention? Well, the prime reason is that the wigner willi distribution is a nonlinear function of the signal. In fact, just look at equation 1, it is fairly clear that it is a quadratic function of the signal, which means it is a nonlinear function, whereas a short time Fourier transform is a linear function of the signal. Whenever you are sampling linear functions of the signals, you might, uh, you are uh, okay with using the sampling theorem that we use for the signal itself in the, in the sense that whatever sampling frequency or the sampling interval I choose for the continuous time signal, I can use that for the transform as well. But in the case of wigner willi that is not the case because I have a nonlinear function here and we will try to understand why this nonlinearity presents a challenge or uh, uh, an additional issue. First, let us write the rewrite the definition of wigner willi in this fashion where I replace t by 2 with t and therefore, I have a 2 appearing in front of the integral and the z becomes 2 z here. That is the way you can look at it, but the rest of the expression looks the same and when I write this for discrete time signals, the integral is replaced by a summation and now I have t s appearing because d t is t s now, which is a sampling interval and z is replaced by the normalized frequency exactly the same way that uh, in the same way that, that we saw for discrete time signals. When we move from continuous time to discrete time, we move from continuous time free, uh, continuous frequency 
or the frequency for the continuous time signal to the normalized frequency. So, we move from z to omega and our omega for the rest of the discussion is the normalized frequency which is z over f s. Okay. Omega has now the units of radians per sample. Now, the main point is that the Wigner will is periodic in frequency that is in uh, frequency omega with a period pi unlike the short time Fourier transform. The short time Fourier transform has the same period as the Fourier transform itself that is the discrete time Fourier transform and the discrete uh, uh, whereas the Wigner Willi has a period of pi in frequency. Now, how does it make a difference? Let us look at this example and understand the consequences. The ex in the example, we have a signal x right? and I have let us say a transformed version of that which is we call as y and the transform is simply a quadratic. So, that this example is more consistent or closer to what we do in Wigner Willi. For the purpose of discussion assume that the signal x is a sine wave. So, what I am doing is I am taking a sine wave and squaring it and the question in hand is whether it is right to sample x of t and then construct the transform or directly sample the transform itself. Okay. That is exactly the question also we have in Wigner Willi. Should I sample the signal and uh, should I decide the sampling for Wigner Willi based on the sampling of the signal or should I decide the sampling for y based on the Wigner Willi distribution itself. Now, to get a feel for the answer to the actual question, in this example observe that the squared signal is twice the bandwidth of the original signal. Well, that is always the case not only in this example whenever you are squaring a signal the bandwidth of the squared signal is going to be twice that is because look at x, x is a sine wave of frequency omega naught and y would be sin square and using trigonometric identities I can always write sin square as 1 minus cosine 2 omega t by 2 that is half of that. Therefore, the frequency in y is double and therefore, the bandwidth is also double. Consequently, whatever sampling rate I am using for x has to be doubled when it comes to sampling y right because sampling theorem is based on the frequency content of the continuous time signal and the sampling maximum frequency in y at least in this example is 2 omega naught whereas, the maximum frequency in x is omega naught. Therefore, whatever sampling rate that I may choose for x may not be applicable to y because I, I can choose for example, 3 omega naught to sample x that is not enough to sample y uh, and avoid aliasing. So, the bottom line is to avoid aliasing of uh, in sampling y that is a transformed x or the quadratic uh, quadratic transformed x I need to choose a sampling rate for y which is twice the sampling rate that I choose for x and that is the same story for Wigner Willi as well. Of course, I am arriving at this result in an intuitive way with the help of an example there are formal proofs available in the literature and I will give you references to look up these formal proofs. Before we talk about the uh, further remedies or other possible remedies, let us take an alternative viewpoint which kind of hints the same thing that we learned just now that I need to sample the quadratically transformed signal twice as that of the signal itself. So, again begin from the continuous time uh, or the continuous Wigner Willi distribution, it is continuous in both time and frequency and write this integral for a finite length sample signal assume that you have n observations and that you have obtained this discrete time signal at a sampling frequency f s. The integral now takes the form of this summation where the summation index runs from minus n to n minus 1 and importantly observe that to compute the discrete Wigner Willi now it is both discrete in time and frequency like the DFT. To compute that I need the values of x at fractional instance exactly half the uh, midway between the instance. Particularly when p is odd I require that right. So, for example, I would need values of the signal at 0 0.5, 1 0.5, 2.5 and so on which I do not have because I only have the values of the discrete time signal at 0, 1, 2 and so on. So, how do I generate these values? 
Well, there are two possibilities. One is interpolation where I do not have access to the continuous time signal. Therefore, I cannot go and resample at a faster rate. So, I would interpolate and how is this interpolation typically done? Well, you take the discrete Fourier transform of the, sam of the sampled signal, the finite length sample signal, pad it with the required number of zeros at the highest frequencies. Why highest frequencies? Because the new signal which we call as x tilde which will be of size 2 n where it will where it will also have values at exactly midway between the sampling instants is going to be of higher frequency. I have now samples more frequently than the original one. Therefore, uh, uh, the x tilde is going to be of higher frequency content and therefore, I have to actually concentrate on moderating the uh, or modifying the high frequency content of x which is the original signal that I have. So, I pad this DFT of x with the requisite number of zeros at highest frequencies, perform a Fourier inversion and then get my x tilde. So, that is one way of interpolating it. Of course, if I have access to the continuous time signal itself, I would go back and sample x twice as that that I did uh, previously which is at f s. So, I would go and sample x at 2 f s and then I would get the values at the intermediate instance as well. Right? So, both methods are telling me that I need to acquire the value of the signal at twice the sampling rate as I have chosen, which is the same message that we learned just now uh, where we took a different uh, uh, perspective. So, both perspectives are giving me the same answer. Therefore, we have these three remedies to avoid spectral aliasing of Wigner Willi. Once I generate this 2 n observations of x from n observations or once I have the uh, sampled x at a faster rate 2 f s, then the frequency grid the choice goes along the same lines as DFT itself. So, I would choose 1 over 2 n as the frequency grid. Okay. So, coming back to the remedies now based on our discussion just now to avoid spectral aliasing either I should oversample the signal by a factor of 2 which is only possible if I have access to the continuous time signal and that may not be uh, true for uh, most situations. Then the second remedy is to interpolate at midpoints which is fine it fixes the problem, but there is an additional problem which is peculiar to Wigner Willi which is a problem of interferences. And the third remedy is to use the analytic signal. Now, this is a bright idea because the moment I construct the analytic associate of a signal, I would be reducing the bandwidth by a factor of 2. Recall that whenever I construct an analytic associate of a given signal, I am going to zero out all the frequencies in the negative frequencies and that immediately brings down the bandwidth by a factor of 2. And because I am bringing down the bandwidth of the signal by a factor of 2, Multiplying that by 2 now for the analytic signal gives me the same sampling frequency at which I have already obtained the data. Therefore, I do not have to do any resampling or oversampling and so on or interpolation. I am fine. So, the analytic signal will reduce the bandwidth. The previous two are, uh, are basically not touching the bandwidth, but trying to address the sampling frequency itself. The positive side effect of using the analytic signal is that I can reduce the number of interferences. Recall the example that we had in the previous lecture where we had a comparison of Wigner Willi on real representation of the signal and analytic representation of the signal. In the real representation, the number of cross terms is going to be higher because any real valued signal can be expressed as a sum of two complex exponentials with negative frequencies. And I know from the property of Wigner Willi that whenever I have a sum of two frequencies, I am going to have interferences. Therefore, if I use a real valued representation, the interferences are going to be more because the number of cross terms is going to be more, whereas with an analytic version, I do not have that issue. So, looking at all these, the recommendation that comes down to us is that we should work with analytic representations, which will take care of both spectral aliasing as well as the reduction in the interferences. Right? As I said, these the, we have arrived at this recommendation based on intuitive arguments, of course, theoretical findings, but we have not formally proved anything. So, if you want to see formal proofs, uh, 
You can refer to this uh, short note or short correspondence by Boshash in 1988. And Boshash is a prominent name in time frequency analysis. Or refer to the book edited by these two gentlemen, which gives you very nice uh, proof and uh, insights into the implementation of discrete Wigner value. Right. We will conclude the lecture with an example to reinforce the points that we have just discussed, where we will show how the analytic representation solves both issues. And this is in fact an example that we have seen earlier, where we have two amplitude modulated sine waves of low and high frequencies, in fact of frequencies 0 0.15, center frequency 0 0.15 and center frequency 0 0.32 as you can see from the command here. Now the amplitude modulation is a Gaussian amplitude modulation. If I use a real representation for the signal and I look at the wigner willi distribution, I can see these four atoms here in the time frequency plane. In addition to that, I have these interferences coming out of the interactions of these four, uh, four frequencies or center frequency atoms. Now, why do I have four when I have only two frequencies in the signal? The main reason is, let us look at the first one. The center frequency of the first atom here is 0.15, but because I am using the real representation, remember a sine of frequency 0.15, underlying is a sine wave, it is only that you see an amplitude modulation. So, sine of 0.15 can be written as e to the j 0.15 plus e to the minus j 0.15 and the e to the minus j 0.15 will manifest as e to the j 0.35 with respect to the 0.5 limit that you have. And also mind you that I am only showing you the uh, positive frequencies. In fact, you will see the, the same thing happening in the negative frequencies as well. So, the same argument can be applied to this high frequency modulated atom whose free center frequency is 0 0.32 and therefore, uh, so you have 0 0.32 here and therefore, you have 0 0.18 appearing as a reflection about 0 0.5 and you would see a minus 0 0.18 also appearing in the negative frequencies. So, the real representation produces these spurious frequencies which are essentially ali uh, alias reflections around 0 0.5 and then you have interferences arising out of this. Whereas, analytic representation avoids all of this spurious artifacts and consequently the interferences are reduced. You have only a single interfering term here, which as we have learnt earlier lies midway in the time frequency plane between these two atoms. So, this hopefully has now helped you appreciate the need for analytic representation when you are working with wigner willi distributions. Earlier we had seen this in the context of reducing interferences, but now it has reduced spectral aliasing and interferences. This is what we have learned. With that example, we draw our lecture to a close. I suggest that you read the two references that I have mentioned earlier to get a more formal insight and look at the formal derivation for the recommendations that we have given in this lecture. And the other point that I would like to reiterate is we have discussed this in the context of wigner willi but the same applies to other modified and smooth wigner willi distributions as well, which we will start looking at in the next lecture. Thank you.